Fantastic. Well, listen, thank you very much um, for the invitation. Uh, as, uh, as has been said, Frank Krauss would have been speaking and giving this talk, but he's quite poorly with COVID at the moment. Like, uh, hopefully nothing too serious, but um, um, it doesn't seem <laughs> so, so great at the moment. So anyway, my name is Ian Vernon. I'm a Bayesian statistician from Durham University, and I'm going to talk a bit about um, the June model and uh, basically things we've learned um, over the sort of last couple of years involved in the, the RAMP sort of project and all that sort of stuff. So <clears throat> a quick mention of the RAMP team. Oh, yes, for any of the stuff I say in here, there's a few um, uh, papers out already. There's others uh, in review. Um, so have a look here if, if you're interested. Um, basically, the June team, uh, we were lucky enough to have a large army of PhD students, part of a Durham CDT, um, uh, again, attached broadly to the Institute for Data Science at Durham. So when COVID started, we were able to employ a lot of these students who are allowed to take sort of time out of their core studies to do a uh, project related to data science. And so we're able to sort of marshal this large uh, mass of, of, of people power to do this sort of stuff. And there's some older, um, you know, less hardworking people at the bottom of the list there. Um, fantastic. So um, I'm just going to skim through this. As I say, this, this was a talk uh, by Frank. Frank gave me a large number of slides last night um, for a 50 minute talk um, and just said, do what you can. So I think I've whittled this down to something approaching 25 minutes, but we'll see how we do. So my apologies if some, some parts of it are just slightly disjointed. There's been a bit of cutting. So um, I don't need to say too much to you guys about modeling um, uh, epidemics. There's a, a discussion slide that you can check later about issues between analytic and sort of simulation style modeling. Um, for June, we've gone down the full agent based route. So we've gone down the full route uh, for reasons that I'll discuss in a second uh, involving granularity and the sort of um, the interventions that we may want to want to make. Uh, so basically, I just want to talk you through the sort of features of June and what we can do with it, what we did with it, what were some of the headaches and problems and what were some of the successes. So um, June is a sort of individual agent-based model. Um, just to warm us up, it started the pandemic. You know, we had the old Imperial College model. This is Frank's slide saying most famous example. I hope that doesn't insult anyone here. But anyway, let's just say a, a famous, infamous, I don't know, uh, a, a big example, the Imperial College model, which was used right at the start of the pandemic to inform the government. And that had various structures to it. It had the classic sort of probability transmission type rules. We will see more of this in a second when we talk about June. Uh, but June is of, of this sort of frame of, of, of work. However, we extend things in various ways that I'll uh, allude to. So let's just get straight down to straight down to business. So um, why do we feel granularity matters? Well, it kind of depends what you're wanting to do, right? We should model at the sort of level of which we're interested, although simple models can't ignore the fact that they, they're simplifying um, assumptions within them. Um, but on the other hand, complex models, of course, are more complicated and there's far more things to sort of estimate and understand. So each have their strengths and weaknesses. However, with COVID-19, it's highly age dependent. So when you just look at the age distribution, say, of London versus the age distribution, say, of the Northeast, uh, these things are totally different. And if we think that transmission might occur more amongst young people who go out a lot, who work a lot, who commute a lot, then you know that the, um, the behavior in London is going to be quite different from, say, other regions of the country. So this is one reason is to get more accurate sort of um, uh, modeling in place. So just to tell you what we did, remembering we've got this large number of people from a sort of data science institute. So these people are computer scientists and uh, physicists used to coding up large data structures using supercomputers, et cetera, et cetera. So you give them a problem like this and they just say, well, you know, how many people are there in England and Wales? Why don't we just put them all in? So we'll talk about the, the sense of this um, plan in a second. But anyway, we took the last census from 2011. <clears throat> we then just coded up its entire sort of data structure. So it has a hierarchical data structure. There's all of England. There's, say, Durham County, for example. There's Durham itself, which splits up into, into um, uh, OAs, which have about 250 residents in each with sort of similar sort of characteristics. So we just built a virtual, pop a virtual population in each OA and trying to make sure the age profile, gender profile, ethnicity, and deprivation index were sort of roughly correct for each area. So an example for Durham, and just to show you the sort of differences between these things, so why it might be important, say, for local planning or understanding of how things are going on. Um, if you take this region in Durham, which is the south of Durham, and look at the age distribution, you find, I don't know if you can see that, but that's lots of young males and females, um, sort of 20 years old, give or take. And that's because that's the university area of the city. If you look at other um, parts of Durham, say one region in North Durham, you see the age distribution looks like this, which is totally different. You have lots of men in their 20s, 30s, 40s and 50s, not so many women. And that's because there's a massive prison there, uh, which has um, more sort of uh, male uh, members. So anyway, all this stuff is coded up and put in June. What else did we feel was important? Well, household components, because 
as we know, the, the, the way COVID burns through households is, is quite interesting and multi-generational households are quite important. So just putting people in a house, we, we didn't feel was quite enough. So for example, we have household composition in sort of 20 different categories at the OA level, um, things like children, young adults, adults, old adults. But we also tried to get the distribution between age differences right in the house. So distribution between couples, age differences, between the area, um, age difference between parent and first children, between parent and second children, because you want those generational gaps so that you have reasonable household sort of family structures, because that's often how transmission occurs, especially into grandparents in a multi-generational household. Anyway, um, so we can then test this, you know, we can of course test against other data sets such as ONS uh, data sets on say household sizes. So this is June's distribution of sizes of people in two person households, four, six, et cetera, et cetera. And that's an ONS sort of sizes survey, which sort of shows, you know, June sort of mimicking the, the rough sort of pattern. Similar things with virtual schools. We actually have like sort of real schools in June, uh, real locations. We populate children by putting them in those in their closest school, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Again, we fill this up um, and, and compare to data sets such as student teacher ratios um, from the Department for Education and then comparing to June to see that we're sort of roughly in the right sort of um, uh, place. Similar with companies, like uh, uh, workers and companies, there's about 20 different macro, macro sectors of companies at the MSOA level, uh, labeled by all these little letters here. So again, we distribute workers around all companies in the areas of appropriate sizes and types. So we get that nice spread of, 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 um, of distribution of companies in different parts of the country. This apparently, um, this is, this, you did this by constructing a large sort of origin destination matrix, optimize this. So there's a kind of way through this that one can, one can do it. Then of course there's commuting because the commuting is a big part of the deal. Uh, we have make a difference between external and internal commuters. So there's external commuting around uh, sort of city to city, you know, railways, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, uh, or long drives. And then there's internal commuters going into their local city, which is a different, quite a different sort of phenomena in a sense. So that's all kind of in. Oh, by the way, June is fully sort of open source. You can download it yourself. You can have a play with it yourself. Um, although it is relatively heavy to run. These are mainly run on large supercomputers. And um, anyway, so what else? A daily structure. Well, June allows flexible daily routines. At the front end of June is quite nice. You can code this up in any way you want. You can change the daily routine. You can change ledger activities. You can do whatever you want. Uh, we just take ONS surveys and translate this into, well, hours of leisure time, depending on age. And then the amount of uh, time spent on different sort of activities. Um, for, for different people in different sort of um, categories. And again, we can then check this against various surveys. So this is um, comparing our simulation with data for an ONS. We have households, commutes, work, school, visits, groceries, pubs, others, and that's June in blue. And the free time survey is in light green, just to sort of sense check. And uh, that's on a log scale, by the way, most people spend their time at, at home. Um, fantastic. So again, there's lots of other details in here. And um, so social mix mixing matrices, as we know, a key part of, um, of, of a transmission of, of diseases is how people mix. So we use the Polymod and BBC pandemics uh, project surveys. We had to amalgamate these and fill in some gaps with these. These are obviously very useful, very important. The, these surveys, I always worry a little bit because of course the, the surveys which are, you know, there are biases in built into that. So one has to be a little bit careful, but essentially we amalgamated these, fills in some of the gaps in, in one of them, I forget, there's no data for like young children, I think zero to five year olds. Um, so we, we, we filled this in in various ways and you get these classic nice mixing maps, you know, households on the left. So there's uh, ages here. This is the amount of mixing. So that's sort of adults. I was going to say of my sort of age, sadly, I'm a little bit over here. But anyway, uh, mixing with young children, which I do have. So that would be me somewhere there. Uh, then in schools, for example, you have young people mixing with similar age young people and a little bit with their teachers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, then we have our disease transmission. Again, a bit like the imperial model formula we saw from before, based on classic Poisson processes, um, which, uh, which you know, are reasonable approximations for short time intervals, I guess you could say, and um, which have various components such as susceptibility. We have a whole list of beta components for each location, household, companies, schools, leisure, and um, sort of like groceries, everything. There's a whole list of these. Um, and moderated by contact matrices, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So sorry to speed through this. I want to give you an overview. I don't want to sort of uh, dwell, but feel free to look at the slides and um, and come back to us with more questions. Again, we have infectiousness profiles, which you can code into June in a very nice way. Um, one might take, you know, larger ones for severe, for mild, for asymptomatic. You can change the length of time for these. You can change to sort of days for infection. Like for Omicron, we change the days to infection to, to like three and a half days, uh, uh, similar to what Jasmina was just saying. 
because it, it feels that that sort of is coming, is coming on a little bit faster. So, and classic route through uh, a, a model with one variant. Uh, we have multiple variants in June. I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, classic route is the usual infected, asymptomatic recovered. Um, you can have mild symptoms, severe symptoms. You can recover from these, but you can have severe or hospitalized or I, uh, I, um, intensive care, and you can die from these sadly, or you can recover. Fantastic, but we went a bit further. <laughs> so, um, for example, we wanted to get the sort of rates of outcome broken down by age. So after the first wave, there was sort of quite a bit of data on this sort of stuff. So we tried to extract this, or, and we worked with um, Kevin Fong, who is on various NHS commit, uh, committees and works in the NHS, and um, some of his um, collaborators. So we had access to NHS data. And in fact, we were collaborating with the NHS sort of throughout this. So we're able to gather various sources on this. However, this is this is Frank's phrase. I, I, I hate to blame him, but this is a tiring data mining exercise uh, with inconsistent and often contradictory data. Um, so it is quite hard to put all this together, actually. And in fact, some data sets were just uh, was just clearly in conflict. So we tried to sort of amalgamate them and and replace any conflict areas with sort of reasonable judgments from 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 Kevin or from others uh, about this. But essentially, these show broken down by age, the sort of outcome upon infections. Um, so asymptomatics, mild and then severe, and then having to go to the hospital ward, and then uh, other things such as dying on the ward, such as dying in ICU. And that's for general people, that's general population, male, female. And then this is for care homes, because of course, the outcome for care homes was quite different when you looked at the, the sort of what things would happen to care home people. So for example, um, care home people, sadly, if you look over 80, uh, care home people over 80 going to the hospital are rarely put on ICU because of course, um, quite often especially in the first wave when hospitals are under pressure the decision is made to sort of uh, how should we say uh, let let uh, let things go their natural direction which is very sad but that's kind of um in, in, important for sort of planning about icu beds um if one doesn't do that you have very larger numbers of sort of 80 plus year olds coming in and if you're assuming they're all going to go straight into icu you're going to get sort of quite off and um, predictions for ICU usage. And this is comparing to another model. I don't want to say too much about this, but it's sort of comparing our male female results to another prediction from this. Again, <laughs> I'm a Bayesian statistician on the calibration end. So there's certain details of June I'm unaware of. So uh, I won't say too much about that right now. Okay, so um, policies. The nice thing with, with a mod like this is that um, one can code up a lot of the policies quite directly. So when the government closes stuff, closes of schools and universities, well, we have schools and universities in the model, so we just close them and it's quite simple. Uh, other things require a bit more uh, nuance, um, such as you know, various social distancing uh, measures, but there are this level of detail makes it in some sense easier. On the other hand, there were so many different policy changes, it's quite a, a task just to put all those, all those all in in reasonable ways. So you can imagine it's a sort of fun game to do all this, but a bit sort of um, a bit exhausting. So there's other things we can validate with. So for example, 2020, this is the number of school children at school. It starts to ramp up before the summer holidays. There's like July, and then it goes down to zero. And that's in blue is the real sort of data. In green is what June is doing, kind of steps up and then drops down. And again, similar things in June, we have people going out socializing in, in pubs and restaurants and stuff. So we can just look at that too. I mean, again, one may wonder uh, if that level of detail is enough, but on the other hand, um, sometimes it may be, and um, and we can just check it. So in blue here is the open table survey, which I believe is a survey of sort of restaurant usage. I think, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and then we can see that June basically is this dot, a, a dashed green line here, uh, sorry, solid green line here, and it just goes up in a similar way and drops down. And this incidentally was the eat out to help out uh, phase uh, just before things start to go badly wrong in September. So, um, uh, which is quite interesting and we, we we see signs of early growth there which is quite interesting whether it's related to that or holiday travel is interesting to say so okay so that's a bit of a high speed summary of the june model my apologies there's more details in our first paper uh, which is out on the med archive and published and um, so please have a look there if you're interested but essentially it's got all these components the population the people where they live household demographics deprivation all the locations they're in it's got all the types of interactions so through different activities school work leisure and the locations they're in the movement they do and the various mixing they might do uh, the disease if there's one or now in fact there's several boxes because you can just code up any new variant you want and put it in its various characteristics now and um, have various characteristics and disease progression one could put in 
And then, of course, there's the policies, as we've discussed there, sort of, you know, working from home, leisure venue closures, all that sort of stuff, which one can put in. So it's basically this level of detail. Now, um, now we can talk about the results of the sort of first wave. So, of course, we were coding this up as the pandemic was sort of progressing. I mean, this was kind of aligned with the early stages of ramp. And um, basically, we um, calibrated the model in the process. I'll have a few slides to discuss in a moment because that's more my sort of world. I work in UQ and emulation and whatnot. Um, but just to show you, give you a taste of what we sort of see. So these are plots of um, uh, daily hospital deaths. Um, here is England as a whole. Here are the seven regions, Northeast, Midlands, London, East of England, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So these are the sort of results we get. So um, black is the data and blue is a single June run. And I will say something about the danger of looking at single runs in a second. But essentially, um, you can see we get reasonable fits here. We're hitting these different regional uh, situations here. And bear in mind, we have no individual parameters for each region. We don't ever fit any individual region. We just fit the whole country. It's just that we've hard coded in you know, the regional differences in terms of demographics and, uh, and ethnicity and all these other things which might affect these, these plots. Uh, similar for ages. So again, for age distributions, here's zero to fives. Thankfully, uh, not many deaths there. Uh, here's six to 17, a few. Uh, here's 18 to 64, 65 to 84, 85 to 99. Um, and again, data in black, June runs in blue. And you can see, you know, we're doing all right. It's not perfect everywhere, but you can see June sort of uh, broadly mimicking uh, these age, age demographics. Uh, and again, of course, um, we can uh, mimic the, uh, the, de uh, the uh, sorry, different breakdown of deaths. So for example, this is daily deaths. And in green, we have care homes. Uh, green is the June um, output. And then in the dotted lines, we have the actual data. And then we have hospital deaths in orange, which is here, and dashed line is the is the data. And then we have total deaths in blue, which is related to what you just saw. So you see, we can break it down into different places. So if one wants to go through and sort of analyze you know, where people died and how did they die, what do you think the roots were and all this sort of stuff, you can see June is quite a rich tool for uh, being able to go over and sort of carefully analyzing what sort of happened um, in, in, this, in this situation. However, of course, we're talking to the NHS throughout this and Kevin Fong is a very nice, but very persuasive character. Uh, and he's on several committees on pandemic sort of preparedness. I forget the precise name, but um, uh, the sort of NHS sort of reaction to, to uh, disasters and whatnot. So he's always saying to us, look, can you give us predictions for the future? Can you give us predictions for the future? But of course, you know, um, as a statistician, I'm always, um, how should we say, uh, nervous about giving hardcore predictions for the future. And I really want them to be sort of fully calibrated, all that sort of stuff. Anyway, we broke down in about early September and just said, look, this is our best run to date. And it looks like this. Um, and we gave it to him about here. Um, and uh, and that run did okay. It did run okay, although I'll say a couple of words about that in a second. Um, that was the sort of prediction for the start of the second wave, which I think uh, the NHS were being told maybe it's going to be a little bit later, a little bit less severe. I think that's more of a sort of political statement than a, a modelling one. Uh, but uh, of course, this period here is where the government did put in um, partial lockdown in November, regional things in, in October, which sort of slows this down. That's the sort of thing we were getting. So, so, so Kevin was very pleased and was able to you know, report back to his um appears about this sort of stuff anyway other things which i won't stay on for too long and you can ask about sort of social imbalances here and again we've just put in all the regional and sociological differences encoded in the census data so, so a lot of what june puts out is just kind of what is in the census but it's interesting to ask what is the full extent of what this sort of says so you know percentage of cumulative infections per age group you get some sort of distribution like this um, but again, what's more interesting is uh, impact of household size. So the data here is the blue dots and the, the bar chart is what June predicts. So we get sort of a, you know, a reasonable percentage of infections given sort of household size, which is quite interesting um, to, to sort of pick that up in, in that sort of way. What again is of interest is impact of ethnicity. So again, just coding up where people live, the sort of houses they live in, which cities they live in, the sort of ethnic breakdown of those locations we naturally get that there are a, a breakdown in ethnicity in terms of um, a number of sort of infections or prevalence within particular groups and, and predicting you know, differences between certain groups, but perhaps highlighting actual issues uh, which uh, were quite topical sort of uh, at the time. <clears throat> okay, now that's kind of like some of the information one can extract from June, but of course, how do we actually calibrate a mod like this, right? It's so complicated. It takes a while to run. So it would run, say, overnight, but on a very big computer, sort of um, it's a heart tree facility we run it on, large computers in the UK, hundreds of cores, and some pretty heavy coding. We had some amazing help from Brian Lawrence, who really helped us speed up the code by a, a factor of 100, which is amazing. So some real sort of hardcore computer science sort of help. Um, 
However, how can we use this? You need to calibrate the model like this. And this is where things get a bit sort of tricky. Um, so here's a, here's a process that I'll talk to you about. And then let's talk about sort of some other strengths and weaknesses of this. So we have many parameters in June. We started with about 18. And as we progressed through the second wave, we added about five more. Um, but we define ranges on these, you know, search range in which one might want to look in. So basically we use, and this is where I come in, we use what's called Bayes linear emulation and history matching. Uh, many of you will have heard of GP emulation, Gaussian process emulation. Bayes linear is like that, but we don't make all the normality assumptions that a Gaussian process has sort of hard coded into it, which can sometimes lead you astray. And um, this comes from an area of UQ, which has been around for 25 years now. So there's 25 years of sort of experience of dealing with heavy, complicated models like this. And we do a process called history matching, which is like calibration, but it's a bit sort of hands off. It just finds regions where there's good runs that match the data. And then you can convert that into a full Bayesian analysis with posterior distributions if you want to, which is good if you really love your model. Um, you probably, probably don't want to do that if you're still testing your code and recoding up your model. So history action can be good in itself. So we do a bunch of runs, and this is daily deaths, first wave, second wave on a log scale. We do a bunch of 125 runs. We construct an emulator for these runs to mimic the June model, but the emulator mimics the model over that 18 dimensional space. And um, But the emulator is blindingly fast to evaluate, it evaluates in like a hundredth of a second, and it mimics the model to a certain level of accuracy. We then just rerun batches of runs. We use the emulator to sort of rule out the bad part of parameter space. And then we run another batch of runs. In fact, this is the, the third one here. Um, and we get sort of runs like this. And then we re-emulate, picking up the summer period here now. And then we get another batch of runs, which now are agreeing with our early data. And then we focus more on later time periods uh, and, and so on. And this is a sort of history matching method where we focus actually on the bad parts of parameter space, ruling them out, to then hopefully identify in globally in terms of uh, the set of parameters, all of which are sort of matches to the data or, or, or close. Because really, we don't just want to find individual runs, because that's a little dangerous. We want to find kind of all the runs that are possibly good fits. So anyway, from, from there on out, uh, then sort of to test if June is going to do all right for the next wave, we grabbed a handful of pretty good runs uh, up to this point here and did the same process for the next sort of period. So another sort of exploratory wave just to see if it was uh, doing OK for the second wave. And as you can see, it's, it's doing all right. You can see there's a, a little bit too much aggressive stuff in the November lockdown year, um, but we're capturing a broad sort of space. Um, what does this teach you? Well, it teaches you more about your model. So the input space of your model, this is like um, about 18, 20 of these input parameters. And the emulator then tells you about the regions of your space which, are, which contain good fits to your model. That's after one wave of runs. Yellow is good, by the way. And then two waves of runs, three, four, five. And we get down to these sort of... Um, more interesting regions where if we run runs inside those, we see some of the good runs that you saw in the preceding plots. And you can look at the sort of relationships between companies and households and which ones we've learned about, household visits, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, care homes, whether there's still a bit of uncertainty in them. So this is what we talk of in UQ as a full sort of uncertainty analysis. Okay, and um, that's sort of how, how we did to, towards the second wave. And these are now, sorry, all the regions of England and England itself, top left-hand corner, that's total deaths, hospital deaths. You can see nationally it's looking good. Some certain regions are quite good, other regions less so. But of course, then we got to the end of 2020 and um, our wonderful set of PhD students had to go back and, uh, you know, annoyingly work on their PhDs again. So, of course, things slowed at this point. Um, we, we got UKRI funding, but that took about five months to come through. So we basically had a bit of a gap. We've now got two postdocs working on this, so things are sort of up and running again. But we, um, we took a bit of a, a break at that point. Uh, so anyway, so just a quick bit about uh, June current projects. I think I've got one and a half minutes left. So what's going on now with June? Well, <clears throat> we're working with UKHSA um, slash PHE uh, rebranding. Re and uh, they're running June. They're interested in using it for future pandemic planning as well as current COVID analysis. Of course, there's stuff going on with COVID right now, but there's also the whole looking to the future and what sort of structures would you like to have in place should something like this hit us again. So we've run some sort of loose Omicron projections at, at Christmas 2021. Again, a little bit loose, um, but I'll show you those in a second. Uh, and that required putting in lots of variants in June. Uh, the UN has also taken up June and is using it to model Cox's Bazaar. That's the, that's the largest refugee camp in the world. Um, and they're using it there and doing some really interesting work with there with a former one of our team. There's also a team in Germany who have recoded June up using the German census and, and coded up there for several regions in Germany. So using it for predictions there. So that's quite nice. So yes, that, that's some Omicron projections we did at Christmas. Quite quickly, I hasten to add. Um, but those are deaths. I think we are about here. What's our daily death? Sadly, about 160 or so. And we're into March. So that green one 
That's with a single version of Omicron, uh, not the sophisticated levels that Jasmina was talking about. It's very interesting her extra versions of uh, Omicron there. Uh, and again, you know, I would I would view those as interesting scenario things, but I wouldn't uh, put too much too much weight on them. Okay, uh, there's the Cox's Bazaar stuff. Just to show you a few pictures, it's quite cool that this is being used by the UN. We'll see how that sort of plays out. Now, I'll just summarize with things we've learned because I think I'm out of time. Um, but <laughs> creating up and coding a model like June during the actual pandemic is well demanding. And testing the model, coding improvements on the fly is, uh, is a bit too much. And we did have a lot of issues with the data collection, like, you know, lags, hospitalization data, you know, all that sort of stuff uh, requires a real careful observational sort of error analysis. Um, but all this emulation methodology does allow you to use these very slow models quite well because the emulator is just fast. It mimics the model. You can do all the stuff you need to do. But really, I would prefer to do a full sort of UQ quantifications, uncertainty quantification, putting in all the uncertainties to make the analysis really meaningful. And that is hard to do on the fly, especially sort of as the pandemic rolls on and uh, when you're uh, a bit short of uh, person power. Okay, thank you very much. I hope that gives you a little taste of what we've done. Um, and um, yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Ian. Um, no, no, you're perfectly on time. You have left four minutes <laughs> for questions. And there's a quite interested one <clears throat> in the chat which has to do with what uncertainty is left in the model. The question is, how would you incorporate personal behavior? Uh, mm. per behavioral dynamics is the word used in the question. And how would you also try to distinguish between what is spontaneous behavioral change faced with an epidemic and the behavioral change generated by policy interventions. Oh yes, absolutely. Now, now this is a. If I think about all the uncertainties, if one actually has to make real predictions that one really wants to, you know, bet your house on, when you think about all the uncertainties, of which there are many, uh, the behavioral uncertainty is a, is a huge one. Um, um, uh, also, the the behavioral uncertainty related to future policy decisions is one. The response to those policy decisions is another. But even the far more interesting one is the feedback loop people get when they see how COVID is going. Because really, if COVID is going badly, people moderate their own behavior, right? It's not just a response to policy. So yes, I mean, in June, we can put in people's behavior in parameterized forms, uh, and we can leave that open and leave that uncertain. And in fact, some of the runs I showed you, and I showed you this bunch of runs running into the second wave, quite a lot of the spread of those is because we weren't quite sure, we we're uncertain about people's behavior in response to a second wave. Like, would they, would they go back to being very careful with the social distancing like they were in the first wave? Or would they still be a bit more sort of um, blase about it? So that's uh, part of that is in, is in June, but it can often lead you to the answer. And this is the scientifically correct answer, which is, when I predict into the future, I really am quite unsure. But the good thing with a model like this is, is that you can then um, deconstruct why you are unsure. And you can say, well, we could spend a lot of money gathering data of this form, but it won't really increase my uncertainty because my primary uncertainty is over, say, behavioral. In which case, you might be able to learn a bit more about that by surveying people or monitoring how people did, how they acted in the first wave. So the key thing, from my point of view, and again, this is Bayesian statistician hat on, is, is an uncertainty quantification tells you all the different types of uncertainty, where they are, and whether there's anything you can do about them. So that, I think, is the kind of one of the uses of a, of a detailed model like this. Hmm. Thank you very much. That was Pietro Monticone's question. There's another one which is kind of quicker. Have you thought about adding super spreading behavior to this model? <laughs> we thought about putting Dominic Cummings traveling up to Barnard Castle in the model, but um, but we thought that would be a bit political and would probably um, stop us getting funding. Um, uh, yes, uh, one can. We haven't put it uh, in explicitly. Uh, it has been discussed uh, and would be relatively okay to do in terms of, you know, we have every individual track, essentially. Um, so uh, that is a poss possible uh, thing to explore. Uh, we haven't done it as of yet. It would be quite interesting to do, especially if we had some sort of well-controlled cases um, where one could um, sort of explore the sort of parameters of such super spreading events, because of course, you know, uh, there are many different kinds of super spreader, but one could in principle do it, yes. Yes. Jasmine has a take on that. Can you model different networks in June? Because super spreading could be simulated via some kind of network uh, construction. Yes. Well, this is the problem, isn't it? So we have, so if you can imagine the network, which it might be based upon, part of that may just be 
the standard ways people interact, like household, their particular school, the particular pub they go to. So we do have like individual leisure venues. So in terms of people regularly going to local leisure venues, if that is the network which is causing this, or their local school, their household, their leisure venue, their gym or whatever, that technically is in is in June. I mean, you know, we don't find gyms have, have a huge effect, but they are there in if you want to, in a sense. Um, it is interesting to think about imposing an actual structured network, like beyond that standard activity. And that I think I think we could do, but I'd need to think if that would be a, an easy coding task or a very hard coding task. I'm not the coder, so I would sort of uh, defer to my to my colleagues. Um, but it would be interesting to see if that would be uh, beneficial beyond those those classic structures of just routine activity, as I say, pub, gym, restaurants, schools, locals, the stuff that you do. Thank you very much. The, there is a further question in the chat from Carl Whitfield, but it's quite a technical one. Maybe you want to answer it in the chat because it's about what the parameters are dynamic etc and which are Ooh. fixed i'd be happy to to chat chat away yes in, in in the chat no problem at all yes okay because now we have reached the moment of having a break apparently in the organization is that right Claire? yes sir.